We are live on air. All right, all yours, all. <laughs> I think there's a few seconds delay, but let's assume we're good to go. Welcome, everybody, to Disrupt TV. My name is Vala Asher. I'm the Chief Digital Evangelist for Salesforce, and I'm the co-host of our show. I'm jo joined here with Ray Wong. Uh, our show just got disrupted. <laughs> for the last 28 episodes, we've been on Blab platform. We launched Disrupt TV on Blab because it was a new uh, beta social networking video streaming site. Unfortunately, this Monday, Blab shut down. So we're now on Google Hangout, soon to be YouTube Live. So follow us on Twitter at Disrupt TV Show to learn where we're going to be going <laughs> for our Friday shows. And uh, use Disrupt TV hashtag to ask questions of Ray, myself, and our extraordinary guest. Uh, Ray, uh, are my uh, best-selling author, founder, and CEO of Constellation Research, and one of the top social futurists in the world. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I'm joined by Vala, and as Vala was saying, this has been an interesting experience because we are about to get disrupted on Hangouts as well as Google changes its platform. So exactly, we're, we're shifting. But happy to be here with Vala. Everyone knows uh, one of the leading thought leaders um, on the marketing and on the tech side, and more importantly, one of Huffington Post's top, top writers uh, for Huffington Post, and of course, a leading thought leader at Salesforce. So with that, let's start with something fun, something creative, something innovative. Vala, all yours. Awesome. Well, it's my pleasure uh, and raised as well to introduce Nora Herding, uh, the co-founder of ImageThink as our guest. Nora and her, and her co-founder, Heather Willems, build a multi-million dollar business from a drawing on the back of a paper napkin. <laughs> Friends in school, they had an epiphany one day and decided to launch a business to help top executives operate more efficiently through visuals. Today, Nora's company, ImageThink, revolutionizes the way we learn and transform ideas. ImageThink helps 35% of Fortune 50 companies translate their complex ideas into simple visuals. Nora also has a new book based on 10 years of experience helping companies translate complex ideas into visuals, and the new book is called Draw Your Big Idea, which we're going to talk about. Nora has been featured on uh, Today Show, Inc., Forbes, Entrepreneur, Mashable, American Express. I had to sh shorten the bio because we only have 20, <laughs> 20 minutes to talk to Nora. Welcome, Nora, to Disrupt TV. <laughs> Hi, Paul. Thanks for having me. We're really so, excited hey. to be working with you. Awesome. Uh, hey. Bye. Cool. No, it's great to have you. And, and you know, the graphical recording industry was basically nascent in the early 1990s. You two were like early pioneers taking this from wonky, innovative creation centers to now mainstream design thinking. Start with a little bit about the journey that both you and Heather took, and how did you get together? Okay, yeah, I, lo I love the description of wonky because uh, the, although it's really become much more visible like with the likes of like us being at South by Southwest back in 2012, and, but it started, as you said, uh, decades ago, mostly in Silicon Valley um, around organizational development, and, but it was incredibly niche, and um, the group of people who first started doing it described themselves as marker sniffing, uh, sniffing hippies. Um, so it, it you know, impassioned people, but not necessarily looking for how this was going to intersect so much with the professional uh, business world and especially tech and innovation space. Um, and Heather and I both, uh, we met in school, as you said, uh, too long ago for me to mention. Um, and we, we both got fine arts degrees and we got masters in fine arts. Um, and I always thought I was going to be an academic. I left, I got a visiting professorship where I was teaching photography and new media. And um, Heather was saving up some money to travel around the world. So as uh, somebody with a master's in fine art is very likely to do, she got the most popular job, which was uh, waiting tables. Um, where oh, she, no. <laughs> she would listen because um, she was super creative and turning everything kind of an opportunity for her art. She was listening to uh, people at the bar at the restaurant she was working at and she started uh, eavesdropping on them and writing down what they said and turning it into pictures. And then one day a table came in and they were like, oh, we, we have like the, we're so bored, like tell us something interesting, you know. And she started chatting with them and, and showed them what she was doing and they said, wait, so you listen to what people say and you write it down and you make pictures out of it. She was just kind of like, yeah, yeah, a little bit. They said, do you know that you can get a job doing that? Well, these people were from um, Capgemini. 
Uh, and Capgemini is, as you probably know, a big global consulting company, and they had designed thinking spaces, like physical spaces that they built um, around the world. And it was um, staffed with a bunch of creatives, freelancers, and her and I uh, first started working with them. And that's, we, we would put really, really big, uh, huge IT projects through these sort of three-day design thinking workshops. And it was a great combination of um, our background as teachers and using visuals. And so in, in 2009, um, we, we started, we started ImageThink, and uh, it's been an incredible journey ever since. What city were you in? Was it Cleveland by chance? Uh, oh, well, where Heather was, she was in Columbus because we went to the Ohio State University. Uh, okay, yeah. because um, Chris Meyer is a really good friend of mine, and you guys are at the Center for Business Innovation, if I remember correctly, because I was a student of yours <laughs> in one of the classes, I think. <laughs> so, awesome. I, I want to I take that offline to learn how good of a student was being raised in the <laughs> and uh, didn't do a disruptive student. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's talk about drawings, and you know, in your book, you talk about the power of drawings. You talk about um, drawing out concepts provides access to all four learning modalities: visual for seeing, auditory for hearing, kinesthetic for moving, and tactile for touching. What are some of the other benefits of drawing, and how you can take these complex ideas and processes and and bring it to life for the visual? Yeah, so that was a great introduction, and and why uh, if we think about you know basically um, education education methodology and a lot around neuroscience is showing us you know uh, that a majority of our our brain is wired to process visual information, but any time that you can combine more than one of those modalities that you said of all of like visual, auditory, or kinesthetic, which is you know picking up a pen, you're going to have you're creating more neural pathways for that information, um, which is important because we're inundated right with with information way more information than we could possibly process, um, and so you you can start yourself as an individual using that and just as simply picking up a pen and doodling like you could be drawing right now as we're talking uh, we can't see your hands so you're, you're fine and it doesn't have to be anything uh, anything nearly as like elaborate or as beautiful as the team at image think does but it's just creating those neural connections between the kinesthetic and the visual as you're processing the information um, and studies show that when someone doodles they're remembering 30 percent more uh, so, you know, some, some people feel like they have to sit at their hands when they're in uh, brainstorming strategies or just, you know, even your weekly, like, team meetings, but it's actually a great way to stay engaged and to remember that, and I always like to talk about as evidence of this is there is an entire uh, library of presidential doodles. So, you know, Eisenhower uh, has these, like, really amazing drawings on these security briefings. Ronald Reagan was actually an amazing doodler, too. Wow. And there's this great, I have this in my talk, I can, and this great drawing that Barack Obama did when he was in the Senate of other senators, um, you know, before he became president. So there's, like, this real correlation between really, you know, high-powered, highly intelligent individuals who have to process a lot of information, and this is one way that they, that they end up doing it, you know, and it's a fun way. So, um, so that's, you know, that's how it works as an individual, and then we, at Image, think we kind of scale it up, and we do a lot of the visualizing um, for our clients, the, you know, ourselves, uh, for their benefit. That's true. That's true. No, that's really cool. That's really now, cool. this is no, hard. This is How hard. do you find people who are good at this? Like, what you know, we often talk about digital artisans and the need for them to be around and and to make it work. Um, what criteria are you hiring for in your graphical recording artists? Because I don't know if everybody has like the skills like that, the you guys skills have. that you guys have. Yeah, I love that question. Because people don't usually ask us about about that. Um, yeah, and when when you know I. Could, Heather and I started, it was just the two of us, and then after, pretty quickly, um, we realized we were going to need more people, and, you know, it was set, it's, at that time, there was probably 200 people in, in the country that didn't. We knew all of them, um, but we really wanted to develop full-time people, and um, 
have time to really make it uh, a real practice and give them real professional experience. So we've ended up developing a three-month curriculum, and we have a really rigorous interview process uh, where we make they come in and we play a TED talk for them and we watch them like we uh, like up on the whiteboard in front of us mm -hmm. uh, take and for those people it's their first time doing that and you know they're generally really talented illustrators so the imagery part isn't difficult but what we're really looking for like the real key is to be a really quick thinker and to be able to synthesize the information um, in in a meaningful way and then draw the connections to that so. Oh, we, we can kind of assess from the beginning where the potential lies, and then it's very much an apprenticeship sort of model. So we have a new person on our team just started last week, Lily. So she's basically, you know, starting out like really simple, like handwriting exercises, like understanding the tools, and then traveling on site with um, our experienced graphic recorders to just basically observe um, and that is part of the journey and, and then uh, after about three to five months then uh, they're, they're good to go and, um, and go out and go out and support our clients but we have, um, we have, we have, have a lot of fantastic people. people. That's awesome. are, are there certain ontology that people remember, certain characters or patterns that help you say no, no, this is going to be, be XYZ, X, this is a pattern or is it just random every time? No, I mean that's a great question and um, you know, we work across all industries, and I'll, you know, I'll be on the phone sometimes with the client, and they'll say, you know, this is a, this is an, on we're having a meeting about this really, you know, amazing oncology immunotherapy, and how are you going to possibly be in this meeting and sort of follow along? You know, you don't have a background in this, um, but what I like to, the analogy I like to give is, we've all probably been in sessions or watched. Um, translators translate like sign language let's say or you know from one language to another language they don't have to be experts in the content they have to be experts in the two languages and how those two things map together and that's what we are at image think so we're able to to take the you know, spoken English and business concepts and figure out how that maps to a visual language um, and then really pull out the high-level things and um, you know in the you know, every industry is different, but I'm sure you guys would agree that a lot of the challenges are the same across the board, right? Uh, technology is a constant disruptor and creating opportunities for um, for every industry. You know, not only high tech industries like but like biotechnology, but also I was working with a company that does. They basically are have a fleet of trucks across the world, and they're they're being disrupted by things like Uber and that kind of model. So, um, you know, disruption, uh, culture, change management, strategy, uh, we all kind of face a lot of the sim similar challenges across the board. Yeah. So that makes our job a little bit easier here. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we, so let's, think, uh, let's talk about your book, Draw Your Big Idea. This is not just a business book. You're, it's about creating space and helping people be more creative, reflect, pull them out of themselves. Who are your target audience when you think about uh, you know, uh, authoring a book where you're teaching individuals to draw their big ideas? Yeah, yeah. So um, this was a really fun project and Chronicle um, publishers based out in San Francisco, they came to Heather and I and, they, and it was great because they just basically said we want to we want to do an image thick book. Like what, you know, what could it be? And so Heather and I sort of synthesized our experiences in the last 10 years working with companies, but also our own experiences as we grew this business from the two of us, you know, as we said, to a multi-million dollar business. And we decided what we really wanted to create first was one for an individual and then next one for organizations. So um, it, it kind of takes you through the whole process of looking at yourself, um, assessing what are your strengths, like what gets you up in the morning, what is your purpose, and then and what is your passion, and then testing that out and finding a way to create something that fills a, a need in the market, and you can take that endeavor and make it actionable. So it's sort of it's ten chapters, and it builds all the way through, um, and it uses visual exercises to make it uh, more accessible because these are big questions, Bala, right? Like when you ask someone like, what is your purpose? Like what are you really good at? And then like, great, you're like, great, you, you know, you want to open a 
uh, apple pie store, then it's like, then, but then you have to ask yourself, like, what is the market for that? And like, who is my customer going to be? And how am I going to organize around that? And so we found that, um, you, that that's a lot of, like, that takes a lot of insight. It takes a lot of um, rigor. And, and by using visuals, we make it um, a little bit more approachable uh, to tackle some of these big questions, but like, more importantly, get people from that idea to uh, to an actualization, to execution. That's awesome. That's awesome. And then we read, you know, so many of the millennials want to start their own businesses, and uh, you know, you're helping not just the Fortune 50 companies, but like you said, a, a person that wants to open up an Apple Pie store. But the process in terms of actualization of an idea using creative processes and logic, this must be commonality there. Where, you know, whether you're helping uh, again a big brand or an individual. There, there, there are certain creative levers that you can that you can use to uh, to guide the process. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's really insightful, and a lot of that is like helping people think strategically, right, and and map out like all dimensionalities of that process. Um, but again, back to what we were saying at the beginning of this interview about learning modalities and doodling is, um, we really believe that by making people put pen to paper. Uh, and get them active and kinetic and then actually be able to visualize some of these components, some of these things they want to happen, uh, that is going to move them closer to that being a reality. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, uh, one last question and before we wrap up, but, you know, there's something really interesting here. I mean, you've gone from, you know, a back of a paper napkin to at NASA to Pepsi, AOL, FedEx, like all these great companies. Um, what are you learning about the innovation process uh, that's happening at these organizations? It's, it's has it changed since you started the company, and and what learnings do you have there? Oh, that's a great question. I, I mean, I think that everybody's getting smarter. <laughs> it seems that way, you know. That's like that, that, <laughs> that means we're getting dumber. <laughs> first, first got into this line of work with Cap Gemini. Um, the, you know, all these really big companies like BP, you know, or the American, uh, the United States Army, um, who were trying to create these big mobilizations and change, would really have to be uh, drug, kind of kicking and screaming sometimes into these design thinking processes. And it seemed super foreign. Uh, but now, you know, 10 years later, I feel like it's, uh, there's a real acceptance around using these kinds of tools to drive ideas. Um, I think that, uh, you know, innovation is the word. Um, sometimes it, it used seriously. Sometimes I think that companies talk about it and they don't realize what that really means, which, of course, like people are now starting to really challenge that and say, well, if you want to be innovative, then you need to embrace failure. You need to, uh, you need to build your operations and your HR and your culture around taking risks, around, um, a, around failure, around maybe moving your metrics and your sight lines beyond like just one quarter or two quarters for, uh, to play like a little bit more of a long game. Um, so I, I really see people getting, embracing that a lot more and getting smarter about what that really means. That's awesome. Ray, I wish I could draw Nora's answers from my Huffington Post. Like, I'm not going to be able to capture all this wisdom in my boring words. I need to <laughs> maybe I'll doodle something. Maybe uh, after, maybe after the 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 you guys post it, we can have someone from our team do that for us. Awesome! Oh, that would be awesome. That, that would, be, would be awesome. This episode oh. of Disrupt TV brought to you by Image Think. Yeah. Oh wow! That would be that would be terrific. That would be terrific. Wow! We are following. <laughs> we are following Nora Herding. Um, Draw your big idea is the book uh, written by her and her partner Heather Wilms. Um, this is awesome. You guys have been at every one of our Constellation Connected Enterprise events. We are so thankful to be able to work with you guys. And uh, it's very exciting to have you on the show. So thank you very much for being here this thank Friday. You, thank you, Mala. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> that was awesome. What a great segue uh, from, from Nora's uh, wisdom in terms of innovation in businesses to having a true innovation junkie <laughs> as, <laughs> as our next guest. We are honored, Ray and I, to have Saul Kaplan, uh, who will be talking to us about disruptive innovation. And, and, and sandboxes and 
And so uh, I'd like to introduce Saul. Saul is the founder and chief catalyst as, at Business Innovation Factory and author of Business Model Innovation Factory. Every year Saul has um, my favorite conference of all time, Business Innovation Factory BIF conference. And September 14th and 15th, we're going to have BIF 11 or 12, Saul. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, so, pretty amazing. Uh, Saul started BIF in 2005 with a mission to enable collaborative innovation. A nonprofit is creating a real world laboratory for innovation to explore and test new business models and system level solutions. Prior to focusing on business model and system level innovation at BIF, Saul served as the, as the executive director of the Rhode Island Economic Development Corporation as the executive counselor to the governor on economics and community development. Prior to that, Saul was a senior strategy partner at Accenture Health and Life Sciences Practice and worked broadly through pharmaceutical, medical products, and biotechnology industries. Saul is super active on Twitter. You can follow him at SCAP5, S-K-A-P-5, and his blog, Saul Connected, uh, as a regular contributor to Harvard Business Review, Fortune, Bloomberg, and just one of the smartest guys that I know. Welcome to our show, Saul. Dalla, way too much, way <laughs> too much, my friend. It's so cool to be with you and Ray today. Uh, and, and Nora was fantastic. Um, you know, the, the power of storytelling is a key ingredient to any innovation process. That was I really enjoyed her uh, comments. Good to be with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Saul. And, and Saul, this is just amazing. I, we've had a chance to connect uh, live. This is, uh, you know, I mean, it, business model innovation is, is not just all the rage right now. It, it's basically what you need to survive. And we're seeing lots of companies just struggling to keep doing what they were doing before. Right. But in, in your eyes, I mean, what, what is business model innovation? What are yeah. companies really trying to solve here? Yeah, this is all about, for me, the difference between incremental change and transformational change, right? And boy, do we live in a century that screams for transformational change, but yet most of our innovation processes are designed to help us do better than what we're doing today, not to completely change it. And I think this is really about the business model, not just taking today's business model. And I don't care if you're a business, whether you're a government agency, whether you're a college, whatever Whatever organization or institution you lead, of course you need to pedal the bicycle of that model and make it better and more competitive, but none of that is going to prevent you from being disrupted. What will prevent you from being disrupted is being able to imagine, prototype, and test entire new business models. If I believe the imperative for leaders today is to do R&D for new business models the same way we do R&D for products and technology today. Boy, we love creating new products. We love developing new technologies but let's face it we have more technologies than we humans know how to uh, how to access and use to solve the problems we have what's missing is the ability to explore new business models let's start talking about minimum viable business models and how do we make it safer and easier to manage in the real world and that's uh, that's why we founded BIF Sure, sure. Now, Saul, you call yourself an innovation junkie. I do. do you need to be, well, first of all, what is it, and do you need yep. to have innovation junkies in order to avoid what you commonly say being Netflixed? Yeah, so, I mean, for, I mean, Bella, you and Ray, I mean, you clearly are innovation junkies, and I'm guessing people who are watching Disrupt TV uh, are innovation junkies. What do I mean by that, right? We're always trying to improve things. We're always about what's next. Whatever we see, it can be small things, like we're standing in line at a supermarket. What are you doing? Like you're trying to reimagine it, you're trying to re-engineer it, right? There's a better way. Or it could be big things. I drive by my uh, the public schools in my hometown, and I scratch my head and say, how did we let our urban schools get like this? We have big social challenges we need to work on, and tweaks aren't going to cut it. Right? We've got a nation of tweakers. What we need are more of people and leaders and organizations that can actually get transformational ideas off the drawing board and onto the real world. So I call myself an innovation junkie. I think it's both a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because you're always trying to make people's lives better, and that's a very cool thing. It's also a curse, right, because the job's never done. The minute 
any innovation junkie accomplishes something, what do we do? We're coming up with the next thing and the next thing. So we're very hard on ourselves, but I'll take the blessing over the curse uh, every day. It's a good thing to be an innovation junkie. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm honored to be called one. I love you, it. you are, my friend. You know Ray is one for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so no, this is great. I mean, you know, when, when we look at what's happening in innovation, when we're thinking about the types of people that actually drive those innovation, they are a special breed. And when you think about the, you know, what makes them special and what makes them, there's probably a little bit about, hey, fearing around disruption. So what yeah. are companies doing to avoid disruption? Yeah. Are they there? Can they think yeah. about it? Do they even know where to start? Yeah, no, I and I don't think they get very high grades on avoiding disruption. I think they they get, we have we give variable grades right to organizations about their ability to continue to strengthen and protect the way it works today, their current business model. You know, that's probably been around for a very long time. Uh, I I like to talk about the difference between share takers and market makers, right? So share taking is here's the industry I compete in, here's where I stack up relative to the competition, here's how I protect my share, and here's how I take share away from someone or some organization who's ahead of me. Most of the world is comprised of share takers, people and organizations. This is what we learned how to do as leaders. This is what we were taught in business school, right? How to be really good share takers better than the next guy or the next company. But I've been really interested in a different animal called a market maker, right? Someone who doesn't play by those rules. Someone who says, I'm not part of that industry. I'm creating a whole new industry. I'm making a market. And for a short while, right? I create it, I lead it until others catch on and then, then it becomes a share taking game again. We need more market makers and what leaders need to figure out how to do is to do both things because you have to continue to be a share taker when that is important to do and you have to create parts of your organization that are capable of market making. We're better at the share taking. Organizations are very slow to pick up the market making part and you can that not tap someone on the shoulder and, and call them the head of innovation and expect them to be able to do both things in one bucket. They're very different approaches. It takes very different skills to be a share taker than be a market maker. And organizations have to get much more sophisticated about how they separate innovation out into incremental and transformational. So grow the pie, create new pies instead of just take the pie. Correct. Right, because you can be taking the pie, and then here comes, and this is what's ticking off a lot of leaders, right? Because here comes Uber and Airbnb and Netflix to completely disrupt you. Those guys didn't invent anything. They didn't invent the underlying technologies in their businesses. They created new business models that delivered value to customers in a better way. Those incumbent industries and companies had all the parts all the capabilities. What got in their way was the straitjacket of today's business model and they didn't have a sandbox to do the R&D for new business models which is I think the new strategic uh, imperative. Okay, this is great. This is a top, This is a word that we haven't heard uh, in the last 29 episodes of Disrupt TV, TV where we've interviewed over 90 business leaders. Okay. What is a sandbox? Yeah. And, and my sense is it's a place to experiment and think differently, but I want your definition of this new term we just heard, sandbox. Yeah, well, I, I'm glad that it's coming up in a lot of uh, places, and I'm not surprised. We use it because we know that the approach to transformational change is different than the approach for incremental change, and we know that organizations have to do both. Right, both. And so organizing around incremental change is, is within the core of your organization. You can create committees, you can uh, sort ideas, you can use traditional financial metrics to say let's do project A, B, or C. You can better predict which ideas are going to add value to today's business model. That's pretty traditional. Over in the sandbox where you're trying to stand up the exploration of transformational ideas, those same approaches don't work. Work, right when the CFO says where's the spreadsheet that predicts how much revenue and how much margin you're gonna create the honest answer is until I get the idea out and a prototype of it into the market to play with it and to see if it works I don't know I'll, I can make up numbers and put them in a spreadsheet but you've got to give us the place to explore to test that's why I use the metaphor of a sandbox we need a sandbox where we can play with the parts because my idea is that it, most innovation doesn't require us to invent anything new. We already have the technology. 
Innovation is about combining the parts in different ways to change the value equation. And the reason we don't do it is because they're locked in the straitjacket of today's business model. What we need is a sandbox with all the capabilities there that we can combine and recombine in new and different ways to change how we deliver and capture value from the customer. You look at any of these disruptive business models, Uber, Airbnb, I will show you capabilities that every organization had access to if they wanted it. What they didn't have was the sandbox to say, what if we put the capabilities together this way to help somebody get from point A to point B? What if we put the capabilities together this way to get access to housing stock that's underutilized, right? They invented a business model that the incumbent industry could have created if they had had a sandbox and the freedom to play with the parts. So is cloud computing yeah. A technology that can allow you to create the sandbox quickly. Yeah. Uh, you don't have to build and, and, and have a capex hit uh, on premise to create an infrastructure for you to experiment. Is that a fair uh, commentary on my yeah, part? Yeah, and you know, Val, I mean, we've talked a little bit about this. This is one of the, I think, most exciting ideas that I want to work with you guys on, right? Because if you think about it, if you if you follow the metaphor of a sandbox, and we need to be able to quickly access capabilities, but to use them in different ways to change how we deliver value, a lot of the capabilities are living in the cloud today. Right? And they're being pulled down from the cloud to support today's business model, to make it better. And that's cool. We should do that. But they should also be used in a sandbox where I can play with them and combine them and recombine them and prototype new models in the market to figure out which ones are worth repeating and scaling, which ones are worth investing more in. So mm -hmm. I absolutely believe that the cloud can be an amazing feeder of capability into that sandbox to enable ongoing business business model exploration. Now, related to that, though, we, get, we got a very interesting question from the uh, live audience um, from uh, Doug Henshin. The question was, why do market makers not often and don't often end up winning or taking uh, the market share? They start the market, they create the market, and then they themselves get disrupted. What happens in that process yeah. in their own business model design that causes them to lose that momentum? Yeah, no, I think that I think that's a great question. There's a phase of this that's exploration, right? Let's figure out whether a new model can work. I can do that at a small scale, right? We we tend to answer the scale questions too early, right? And that'll kill business model exploration. If you make me answer 8,000 questions about how could this work for 80 million people, you know, 3 billion people, right? I'm never going to try the new model. Whereas if you let me explore and experiment with it for a smaller number of people, I can determine whether the model works. Now, here's the thing. Once I determine whether the model is feasible, right, now I have to answer a different set of questions about how it can scale. Right, and those start to become more traditional questions about how to invest in capabilities that are scalable. Right, how do I scale the organization and attract the talent that I need? How do I acquire the number of customers I would need to be able to do this at large scale? You need very different approaches for the exploration than you need for the scaling. And what a lot of, of new market makers fail to appreciate, they're really good at the R and D phase, but they're not good at the scaling phase. Right, and so. I think I think you have to understand and appreciate that there are different phases of the life cycle that require different capabilities and you have to be self-aware enough to know what you're really good at so that you can be augmenting and changing the team and the skills you're tapping into as you move through that life cycle. Sure, sure. And so I know at Business Innovation Factory you and your team obsess about helping business leaders explore and test new models and you have to in a way teach them to look at things through a different lens. Right. You have to help try, try to understand are they trying to strengthen the core are they, or are they really we're, we're through incremental modernization and digitization yep. or are they really thinking about new business models, new sources of revenue, new go-to-market strategies. How do you convince Business leaders, and I know you work with some of the you know top companies in the world. Right. Think about things through a different lens. 
Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think the good news is more and more leaders are starting to get it. I think they get it because they're they're hearing and getting really ticked off by the Airbnb and Uber stories, right? How come we're not proactive? How come we're not the ones that are creating these exciting new business models, right? And so it used to be, you know, you've been following me for a long time, Vela. You, when I first started doing this, you know, when guys like me and Alex Osterwalder and others were yakking about business models, nobody was listening early, right? People People would say, stop using the word business model. Nobody wants to talk about it. Now today, Alex, yourself, yeah, yeah. yeah no, everybody wants to talk about business models today. So, you know, it's kind of odd for us. Like, oh, it's a really cool time to be in this business. But still, I will tell you that leaders have got to be able to see the difference between what it takes to strengthen today's business model and what it takes to set up the conditions, that sandbox, to be able to explore and test entire new ones because if you put them together and you expect the core organization to do both things they will always 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 select the incremental more predictable easier to add value to the quarter to the year right, right? easy like they'll never do the transformational so I think it's incumbent upon the leader and I actually think CEOs should have this responsibility. I think COOs should be running the, the trains and making sure that they're protecting and strengthening today's business model. And I want to see more CEOs that are, are leading the effort and own the projects that are about what's tomorrow's business model look like and what's that exploration look like. So we're going to be better prepared for tomorrow, better prepared to avoid disruption rather than waiting until it's too late. Right. Sure. Is the sandbox the answer to the innovator's dilemma? I think the sandbox is a part of the answer. I think you have to do the incremental, right? Because you always want to continue to strengthen the way it works today. And the nuance here is being able to explore and test new models and then being able to decide from a position of knowing which models are feasible, which models do I want to create separate businesses from, which models do I want to spin off as separate companies, which models might represent the one we need to change to. And now we we have to start thinking about what the change management process looks like. Too many leaders start answering the change management questions before they even know what the model that they're going to change to are. I mean, how many people have been on your show talking about innovation culture? Like, I need an organization and a culture where everybody's innovating. I'm like, like, what does that even mean? Like, I want everybody to innovate. No, I want most people in the organization to make today's model work better, right? And I want some people in the organization focused on what's the different model, the one that might even disrupt the one that we're in today. It's not the same. Sure, sure. That's fine. Hey, now one of the tough parts, like a lot of our clients, and we probably share a lot of clients and, and haven't had, hadn't done the mapping yet, but a lot of them are worried about concept to commercialization. Yeah. Got the idea, disrupted it, the POC works great, and yeah. then nobody wants to adopt it, right? The yeah. thing sits there, right? I mean, we've yeah. proved it, we've made it work, right? And I'm taking it back to those leaders that are actually doing the operations, yeah. and they're like, oh, no, no, I don't want to touch this. Like, how do you overcome something like that? Yeah, no, the, good question. I, I think we have to go back to this notion of minimum viable product versus minimum viable business model. I mean, how many tech companies do you know and entrepreneurs that are being taught create a minimum viable product? Product, right and then they don't talk they don't even think about the business model right until they've already put, poured all of their effort all of their you know the investment dollars they raised you know into the product and not into what the business model is you need to take a business model off of a napkin sketch right and put it into the real world and let it to interact with customers, real-world customers, to know whether the business model can work, whether it solves the customer's problem, whether it can create value. Don't worry about scaling it yet. Don't worry about change management and how hard it's going to be for the rest of the organization to do it. Worry about whether you have a minimum viable business model. When you have one, now let's start asking the questions about what does it take to scale? What does it take to change the organization if that's the right strategy for implementing the new business model? Way too many leaders get bogged down in the scale and the change management questions way too early, and it kills transformational work. Absolutely. So tell us about your popular uh, innovation summit, BIP yeah. 2016. <laughs> yeah. uh, very, very intimate, but one of the most important 
one of the most empowering, powerful, inspiring two-day conferences that I've, I've ever attended. And I believe this is the 12th year, 5th, 2016, September yeah. 14, 15, Providence, Rhode Island. What yeah. inspired you to start the BIF conference? And talk to us about the caliber of the storytellers and why yeah. you put so much time and energy uh, to, to do this incredible event. Yeah, so we uh, we did this from the first year uh, after I founded Biff, and we did it just to build a community and to model the kinds of behaviors that we think transformational change really takes. I mean, we have this notion at Biff that we call enable random collisions of unusual suspects or making a ruckus, right? I think the gold and the transformational ideas are in between our silos. They're in between our industries, in between our disciplines. We've got to get more horizontal. We've got to climb into the gray space between our silos because when we combine the parts in different ways, that's where the innovation happens. But yet we live in our silos. We go to conferences with people who are exactly like us, saying the same thing they've been saying for 20 years. We created an event. I don't call it a conference. I call it a community of wow. innovation junkies. Now they come from all over the world. Uh, we, we don't get any bigger than 500 because we're not trying to scale it, what we're trying to do is create the intimacy of those random collisions. We share stories from the stage, no, no PowerPoint, you know, bullet point presentations. People share personal, intimate stories of how they're trying to transform their part of the world, and we put the most eclectic group of storytellers you can possibly manage to get together. We will have a rabbi talking about how they're trying to transform organized religion next to a police chief who's trying to transform to community policing, you know, next to somebody who's working on synthetic DNA, you know, and trying to transform uh, how we read and write human life. And the it's, we leave it up to the 500 participants to figure out what the patterns are, what's important to them, and they never, ever disappoint. Every year the themes emerge. We don't prescribe them. Uh, people over the two days build the most incredibly intense relationships mm -hmm. and collaborations You know that, as you know, uh, last a lifetime. It's the two most inspiring days of the year for me. Uh, it's a way to recharge our batteries, uh, and I look forward to it uh, every Every single year, I will, sounds, be, I will be there. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> this sounds like the <laughs> ultimate unconference. It is. I mean, you yes, got Carrie Anderson there. You got like, I mean, these are all. I mean, you got Carrie Anderson, Jana Eggers. Someone, she, she's a, she's definitely great. Yeah. Dave Gray. I see Whitney Johnson, who's one of our keynotes. I mean, this is awesome. You got Bill Taylor. Yeah. This is awesome. You got this great event going. On. John Hagel. I mean, yeah. That's awesome. You got a good moment. Hey, thanks, Ray. Yeah, it's going to be fun. We're we're looking forward to it. Join us. Uh, join us. You I am putting it on the calendar for next year. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All our audience uh, members should do that. You won't regret it. I promise. Saul, so, thank you so much. Uh, you dropped a lot of science on us, and thank you for being uh, 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 not a random but a purposeful collision. It's certainly in my life, and I, I appreciate you. Thank you. Hey, my pleasure. Good to see you guys. Thanks for the opportunity. Absolutely. Thank you. Wow. And now we have Larry to talk about this boring, lazy, you know, nothing going on enterprise summer, right? You know, like every summer nothing usually happens. What's hot this week? <laughs> well, first I have a confession. I feel wildly inadequate since I don't have a whiteboard behind me. Yeah. <laughs> so you're I, mean, a you know, I guarantee you're a dude. And I have this. <laughs> Omnichannel dreams will not work for most retailers. <laughs> and that well, okay. I, got, I got a passenger flow model driven drawn by our eight-year-old. <laughs> I love it. Larry has all of the topics doodled and ready to... Uh, <laughs> to well, I only have one piece of paper that I could find, so really I only have two out of four. But he's, a digital, he's a digital native. There's no paper in his office. <laughs> exactly. I'm paperless. paperless. I actually look around his office. There's no way. Let's do proper introductions. Not that no anybody doesn't know who you are. So, <laughs> Larry, I'll, Larry, I'll leave it to Vala. Vala so. uh, Larry Dignan, editor in chief of ZDNet and Smart Planet, as well as editorial director of ZDNet's sister site Tech Republic, um, a frequent guest on Disrupt TV, and we're honored. And we're here to learn uh, from Larry the latest news. Maybe we can start with you know you wrote a fantastic blog about Home Depot and how their tech is paying off as a retailer struggling against Amazon. And it was, it's funny, we're talking about pictorials and doodles. You have lots of 
uh, graphical illustrations of all the different business processes uh, from supply chain to online improvements to overall customer experience and the effort that Home Depot is putting together to, um, to combat against online retailers like Amazon. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, perhaps the best thing about Home Depot is when they do their investor meeting at the end, it's usually December, they talk a lot about tech and they've yeah. been doing this for years. Um, so as far as retailers go, if you want visibility into what they're doing, um, they're pretty in your face about it. They, they've got plans pretty much every year, so they're a, a retailer definitely worth watching. Um, you know, I dropped in on their earnings call and followed the earnings report largely because Home Depot isn't affected by Amazon, really at all. Um, the thing to know there is the average ticket's like 900 bucks, so wow. they're selling appliances, ton of lumber, you know, there's a tornado, they do well. Right. <laughs> um, they do a lot of things that don't ship all that well. But that said, they, they have this whole connected sort of approach where, you know, they're trying to turn the, the floor into more of like a cons consultation. Yep. And a lot of that research starts online. So, you know, they're doing some basic blocking and tackling things like making the site better. Um, but a lot of the stuff for them is kind of the bread and butter logistics sort of thing. Um, how they tweak their supply chain to get things delivered to the store so people can pick up. Uh, there's one slide in my thing that kind of shows, you know, the cost of sending directly to a consumer yeah. versus what happens if people pick up and return in store. And the costs are pretty damn sweet. Yeah. So if you look at retail, I mean, what you see everybody doing is trying to leverage this omni-channel thing so they can meld the stores and the mobile experiences and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, the ideal is that you order online, you pick up in store. That's the holy grail. Got my Home Depot app right here, Home Depot Pro. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. um, so what's interesting about that, though, and, you know, the question, you know, so I looked at Home Depot, Target reported this week, JCPenney, yeah. Walmart. You know, you go down the list and you got to ask the question, if everyone's doing omni-channel, is there any competitive advantage? And my guess is it's just kind of the cost of doing business, right? Because we're... Yeah. We're probably like third, fourth wave into the omni-channel thing. And, you know, it's going to be interesting just to see who does it well, right? And and that's where that's where it gets interesting because um, a lot of this is going to come down to tech, in, tech uh, implementations and execution. A lot of it's going to be experiences they can create. Um, you know, Walmart's trying to nail that down and, do pretty well, but you know, if you look at Walmart's e-commerce sales, it's a drop in the bucket compared to overall sales. That's why they bought Jet, which, right. by the way, is an acquisition I don't see working well. But really, uh, really, so this is a three billion dollar acquisition, and is it a cultural element to it? Is it a scaling element? Walmart versus what Jet has been able? Why, why don't you see it doing well? I I think there's going to be cultural. I think there's going to be execution issues. I think it's one thing to come up with a startup that has a cool idea. It's another thing entirely to apply that to the scale that Walmart has, right? I mean, this is this is not trivial stuff. Sure. And yeah. so, I mean, I agree with the decision that Walmart has to buy the engines to make all that work if they're going to be an e-commerce player at, you know, at the scale of like Amazon. Um, I just think it's tough to bolt all that stuff together. And you know Walmart historically can do that, but let's for you know let's also remember Walmart bought a ton of other companies outside of Jet. Well, it's a good point, right? Walmart.com hasn't exactly you know the, the folks in Bentonville and the folks in San Bruno aren't necessarily working well with each other. So there's been a cultural element over some time, but maybe the folks in New Jersey might work better with the folks in Bentonville. <laughs> yeah, well, Jet's based in Hoboken, I think, right? Exactly, they're Hoboken. Yeah. So that's maybe that help. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that hope, but that's a great that's a great you know segue to actually some of the bigger trends that's also happening uh, that are out there. I mean, really around broader retail chains and supply chain. But let's shift real quickly. Talk about what is going on with Intel and ARM, right? ARM just got bought out by someone, and the Intel's talking about better cooperation. What happened there? Well, I would call this um, the Intel ARM thing. I'd call it pragmatic innovation, right? So. Five years ago, this, I mean, ARM and Intel, they've always kind of swapped IP anyway. They were, they were partners, too. Uh, but what was interesting is that the Intel Developer Forum this week, they basically cut a collaboration so Intel could 
basically make ARM chips, which is a huge deal because what does Intel do better than anybody else? They manufacture chips. So, you know, a lot of chip vendors outsource this to TSMC. They do it with um, a, bunch, a couple others, like a handful of foundries that do it. Intel has the scale that, and the manufacturing expertise that the others yeah. just don't have. So Intel being able to manufacture ARM chips opens up perhaps an Apple deal. Um, they, could do, they could do some serious damage there. So one, it's just a money thing, right? It's great business. No. On the other hand, you look at it, and it's, it's basically Intel going. Um, we're not going to do this x86 things and phones at a big scale, right? Because ARM's everywhere. So why not collaborate with those guys, take a cut of the pie, and make it work, right? So Intel can make money manufacturing ARM chips. The data center is still ruled by Intel chips. So when you look at the Internet of Things, it'll all be kind of connected, and Intel will still have a hand in every processor pie there is. Um, so it makes sense, but it's very pragmatic, right? It's five years ago, Intel would be like, we're going to own this processor stack, and, you know, screw ARM. We're going to beat them. And it didn't happen. Well, and, and look at this. Who is the winner? Is it really SoftBank? I mean, SoftBank bet big, right? They bet big. I think they, well, SoftBank, you know, SoftBank's one of these companies that, you know, they claim to have like a 100-year business plan or a 500-year business plan, which all that means is they don't care about having a shitload of debt. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, it's a different animal, right? So who knows if that'll work? I mean, the, the main thing for ARM is that, okay, now they're tucked in SoftBank and they're probably going to be left alone. And they'll go about their business and doing what they do well. So I, I think the... You know, the interesting here to me, though, is how pragmatic that is, right? And then, so then I start kind of poking around, and I'm like, all right, so Cisco and IBM, they're doing the collaboration thing, making everything work, right? You got the Salesforce, Microsoft frenemy. You got Microsoft in general, right? I mean, Office on iOS and Android, frankly, is probably better than Windows. So everybody's getting pretty damn pragmatic around here now, um, at least boring? among the giants. <laughs> So it's kind of interesting, and ultimately, it's pretty good for the customer. Got it. Is okay. uh, is uh, is Uber getting into the trucking transportation business? Pragmatic. We, we saw Auto uh, say that will help make transportation as reliable as running water everywhere for everyone, whether you're talking people or packages. What are your thoughts about this uh, this marriage? Uh, it's a little lofty. Yeah. But I wrote earlier this week that, let's get real, if Uber's going to make a ton of money, it's going to do it on freight and yes. take a cut of the trucking industry. It's not going to make it Absolutely. taking or, me from or, a bar 2 o'clock in the morning. You mean that or Pizza Hut deliveries isn't going to cut it? <laughs> right. You know what I mean? So, so Uber basically has a twin strategy, right? It's one, take a little cut of all these rides all over the place. The other one's take a nice big cut of the trucking industry. Right. And... You know, they may have bought a business model. Um, the, now, the trick here is the same issue that faces all autonomous vehicles, right? Who's who's liable when that thing, you know, when something bad happens? Yeah. Right? If, I mean, do I do I pay for my algorithm that screwed up when I was in the passenger seat? Um, you know, trucking, I think trucking's an industry, it's almost... I don't know if it's easier to automate, but it makes a lot more sense to me, right? Yeah. Because these these things can run all night, right? So it's well, there's no labor laws, there's no interstate commerce issues with truck drivers having to drive a certain number of hours, right? There's no right. safety. I mean, it really takes out the friction of having to deal with like, oops, sorry, uh, yeah, your guy's at the uh, truck station for truck stop for more than seven hours. We're not sure where he is. <laughs> yeah, so. and even if you had some hybrid thing. I mean, say say there's a truck driver who needs to sleep. Okay, yeah. turn it over to Uber, right? So, it's, driving would be with the, with the auto, you know. Yeah, the business case is so much stronger sure. than on the auto side because the auto side, it's interesting for sure, and it'll happen. Yeah. Um, but it's more like a customer feature type thing. It's sure. and plus, I mean. Frankly, all right, so we'll have autonomous vehicles in cities and West Coast, East Coast. All that stuff you fly over to get from one end to the other, dude, they're not giving up their car, yeah. right? I mean, <laughs> really? Come on. It's not going to happen. Um, and, I, and frankly, 
autonomous vehicles in New Jersey, I have no idea how that'll happen. <laughs> right? You you have to be up to eighty miles an hour on those ramps to even get on a New Jersey turnpike. <laughs> so I can't have an algorithm obeying traffic laws or everyone's just gonna die. So <laughs> Or no one's gonna get there. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Like I, I don't even there are some realities here that eh, I kind of see an algorithm choking over. Here's what we do. We get rid of speeding tickets for autonomous vehicles. They don't get a speed limit. They can go as fast as they can. <laughs> there, was an announcement, there was an announcement with Uber and Volvo, right? Are they in Pittsburgh? They're gonna, they're gonna... Yeah, they're, they're looking at, um, I think it was, it was more <laughs> passenger type thing. Passenger. Uh, I mean, let's, let's face it. The, the end game here for Uber isn't this middleman for drivers and all that kind of stuff. The middleman is to cut out those damn drivers and have autonomous vehicles drive around and then Absolutely. take that entire cut instead of whatever they got to split off to the drivers. Um, I, I thought the theory was like they're were, they were going to go after the medallion market, sink it to the bottom, and then buy low on the medallions and then come back on the high. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in New York, that might work. Um, <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. The taxi medallions, actually, because of Uber, have gone from 1.4 million a medallion to 550,000 now in the city. So that's the impact wow. Uber has had on taxi medallions. And, and that, that in itself has been very, very disruptive for folks who thought that they could retire in a medallion or that they could actually not have to work and put everybody to work on their medallions. So it's, wow. it's been very interesting to watch that whole market. So. It's like a dot-com stock back in the day. Yeah, it's a tulip bubble. <laughs> exactly. Larry, any new any conferences in the in the horizon? Where are you going to be spending your time next couple of months? Uh, next week, I'm going to an OpenStack conference in New York. Um, you know, but we're run to the same issue we have every September and October, where everybody and her mom has a conference. <laughs> and you got to look at the ROI of traveling to these things versus sure. the Wi-Fi connectivity in the in the um, you know Keenan no, Hall. Yeah. yeah. It's, you know, when you stream these things and the news is sort of, eh, I, yeah. you, you know what I mean? I, I kind of look, I look at that calendar coming up in October and I'm like, you know, screw it. Maybe we don't go to any of these. Um, and I, I think that's the issue with a lot of the vendor conferences now, right? Like, am I really going to go to VMworld and then turn around for a week and go back to Open World and then come back and then go back to Salesforce and then... <laughs> We There's the Gartner conference in there somewhere for the CIO <laughs> powwow, the big therapy session every year. Um, I don't know. So I'm still kind of thrown up in the air about where the hell to go. Well, Ray, well, Larry, there, goes, there goes your pitch, Ray, for half one day. Well, Larry, there is your there's your invite uh, to our <laughs> event. Um, you won't have to be bored oh, at that's the right. event. Well, you guys have a good location, though. Yeah. <laughs> don't, send, don't send me an invite to go to Vegas. It ain't happening. <laughs> Half Moon Bay Ritz, Half October 26 to 28. Orlando's on the fence. Um, <laughs> the, but Larry, get this. We we actually have Vince Surf, Doc Searles, um, Mailing Fun all in the same panel, and, and potentially John Hagel. <laughs> so. And an 18 hole championship golf course and an incredible spa. But anyway. I'm, trying, <laughs> I'm not pitching that. I'm pitching content. I'm pitching content. <laughs> and for the love of God, do not have a conference at the Javits Center in New York. Because uh, if I'm in the office in New York, I'm probably not trekking across town anyway. <laughs> it's e frankly, it's easier to fly to San Francisco than go to the Javits Center. So. That's awesome. This, a lot of tech vendors are listening right now and adjusting, oh, they must their, be adjusting their advice. <laughs> so. All right. Well, real quick here. Samsung Note 7, eh, good, bad, test it out. Enterprise ready? I I like it. I mean, it, it's, it, is, it is very sharp. Um, is it 800 and something dollar sharp? Eh, I don't know. Um, I mean, I have the Note 5, and that's that's my favorite device. And the seven's pretty strong. Yeah. You know, the, the price. You know, the issue is okay. Do I really need to upgrade? Yeah. And you know, but the thing that would interest me about it was when I got the review unit. They had the Gear VR. They had the Gear Watch. They yep, yep. they can bundle. They can bundle stuff. And that's what makes it interesting, right? Because, you know, you're, now I'm goofing around with the VR. <laughs> Me, too. Me too. I have the unit. It's been fun playing with it. and it, you know, It's I'll, fun I'll, for about 15 minutes, and then I start to get a little bit of a headache. But I, get, I get dizzy. I get dizzy, too. So yeah, that's how I feel, too. a little bit too much to put that thing on. So. Well, my tolerance for VR is way above 3D movies, which literally I'll walk in a theater and I'll have to walk out in five, ten minutes. Just kidding. <laughs> 
It's, it's a migraine to me. Hey, Larry, this is wonderful having you on again. It's always good catching up on, on the week's news. Uh, we try to do this uh, on every third week we can uh, on Disrupt TV, and please come on back as well. So. Will do. Maybe next time I'll have a whiteboard. <laughs> I felt so left out. <laughs> That's just like, Damn, I have no good ideas, no whiteboard. <laughs> Follow Larry Dingen, ZDNet, at L-D-I-G-N-A-N, editor-in-chief of ZDNet, and definitely... Uh, We're going to send Larry send, Nora's book as well. So. Send Larry Nora's book and a, and a whiteboard. Exactly. <laughs> you wanna, for PR folks pitching Larry, do that, and you might get his attention. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No 3D keynotes at, at Javits. Just yes, and that too. <laughs> oh, man. Well, thank you very much. So this has uh, been a great week again, Vala. I mean, we are <laughs> we're in the middle of this, but we've got some crazy programming coming on next week. Next week's guest in episode 30 is our HR tech issue. And we actually, uh, we've got Anil Bushri, co-founder, CEO of Workday, and uh, definitely VC extraordinaire at Greylock Ventures. Steve Bosey, co-chair on HR tech conference, the big one coming up in Chicago, um, and co-founder of H3HR Advisors, and our own Holger Mueller, VP and Principal Alice at Constellation Research. So we're going to be going big on HR tech for episode 30. Uh, Bala, I mean, crazy, isn't this? <laughs> it is. We might have to have all three of them simultaneously exchange so that you and I can just sit back and tweet their answers. <laughs> I'm actually thinking about this. Like, we're either going to stay on this platform or try click meeting or something else. If you're out there and you've got a cool video platform technology you want to experiment with, let us know because we're going to test them all out. Uh, we're definitely trying to figure out the disruptive and innovative technologies out there in the uh, conferencing space and more in the live streaming space that's going on here. So thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, and Aubrey's sweating as you said all of that, so thanks, <laughs> our producer. <laughs> thanks again to Aubrey, our producer, for dealing with a crazy week, switching platforms on the fly and doing it with four, three or four guests that uh, were probably nervous as well. So. Yeah. <laughs> Testing of platforms this week. <laughs> oh, Happy awesome. Friday. If it's Friday, it's Disrupt TV. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.